So we're going to have some art today, besides all this natural art. Because of the accounts we're reading. The sun was kind of late with all the cloud. And the cloud is there because of all the heat. In very hot days. Or maybe it's warmer because it's cloudy. And the heat is kept like a blanket around the earth. So today we're moving on in the readings with uh, Jacob. And we have this experience of prayer that he had. His intimacy with God. And he felt that God was in this place. So he put up a stele, a stone. I should include that in the post this morning. I had a fleeting thought yesterday and didn't do it. Maybe I would still get it done. I just need to put myself a little reminder and there was a, an article published yesterday, I put it up on, on Twitter, that uh, talks about a stella that was found uh, north of Cairo, mentioning an Egyptian king or pharaoh from the time of Babylon exile, who came to keep out the Assyrians from Jerusalem. But it's interesting then each time something in archaeology is found that mentions a character from from the Bible. But the reference that came to my mind right now is the fact that people put up stones to remember places. Stones usually last a while. These stones could probably even last longer than the building. Buildings that humans make are fragile. It's interesting that the building in Hebron, that where the memory of the burial of the patriarchs and matriarchs still stands, the building is from King Herod. And it's very hard to think of any other building that's pretty complete after 2,000 years. I wonder where on earth is such a building. And so people put up a stone and I saw a stone, still a, a copy of it at Bet Shean last week. I'm not sure if I posted that video. I think I did. No, we had some problems technically. Not sure if I posted it or it got cut off halfway through, but um, I think it was in the video. And the I'm not sure if I put it on YouTube. I should look back and see that. And so this uh, Stella is there, if I remember correctly. It's uh, thirteen to fourteen hundred years before Christ. So that stella was found in Bet Shean in excavations decades ago. In fact, the same excavator, Arfan Najjar, was excavating here in, in Magdala. He's the one who discovered the synagogue. He's the one who discovered the Magdala stone physically. Obviously, the head of the excavation, Dina Avshlon Gurney, was primarily 
mentioned because she was the leader of the dig, but she wasn't here on the two occasions <laughs> when these discoveries were, were first made. So it was quite a glory then for the vice director, Arfan. He was very proud of that, telling the story, finding the menorah and all of that. So this stella in Bechian was, uh, it's one of those ancient stellas, you know? So in the, in the Bible account today, we have Jacob setting up a stella to mark the spot, the spot. And he had this encounter with God and he, he figured this is where God lives. So he called it Bethel, the house of God. And how many places in the States are called Bethel, inspired by the biblical story? Maybe in other countries as well. Beth is a house, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Bethania, the house of mercy. Bethesda, it's also mercy, right? The house of mercy. And then we have Bethel, the house of God. So the word Beth and El is God. Emmanuel, Gabriel, Raphael, and ever since then we have the house of God, that we build houses where we want to meet God. And we know that God transcends every house we could make for him. The famous stories about the building of the temple in Jerusalem. And David wanted to build a house for God and God said, no, I'm building a house for you. So let's go inside there today because of the gospel story. We're putting up a little protection here around this space because all the children coming and people staying here. There are some dangerous spots if people weren't paying attention. So the best thing is to have a little fence around the area. We're going to go in underneath here through the port area. These birds are very industriously trying to get our attention to go away from where they would have their nests. They're not nesting now, because the little ones have hatched and grown and flown. This is what Jacob says, how awesome is this shrine. This is nothing else but an abode of God. And that is the gateway to heaven. I mean, there are many places called gate of heaven, right? Sometimes cemeteries are called gate of heaven. And this prayer, in you, my God, I place my trust. Hey guys, can you pull this please for me? Thank you. So we won't turn on all the lights immediately. Some would come on automatically. People love this picture. It was donated to us by the artist. Almost everybody recognizes who, who's, who it is, right? Who's represented here. 
What I'm amazed is that you can see her soul without seeing her face. Just wrapped in prayer, in adoration. In you, my God, I place my trust. How timely for our verse. In you, my God, I place my trust. And let's see two more works of art. And one is in here. So this chapel here is called the Encounter Chapel. Here we have the live streaming equipment, so we'll also have the Mass here today. And we have the Gospel story from Matthew chapter 9. It's interesting, some of the Gospel stories are mentioned in all three synoptics. Very few events are mentioned in all four, and some have even five mentions. If they're mentioned in the letters of St. Paul as well, like the institution of the Eucharist which point to their significance. And so this is the story of the lady touching Jesus' garment. And there are two stories involved. We'll just go into this point here. It says, Jesus rose and followed him. And in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, this is an official but in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, he says it is the head of the synagogue, who is an official, but in that sense, then it's more precise. And there we see the richness of the variety of Gospel accounts of the same incident. It's interesting listening to people telling the story of soccer games right now with the European Cup going on. I'm not watching that, but a couple of our confreres keep their eye on it and depending which country they're from, and <laughs> they tell the story differently, you know. But they're telling the factual story and they're remembering what they remember from what happened, or how the story's been told in their town, then eventually that goes into the gospel. And the official says, my daughter has just died, but come lay your hand on her. And Jesus followed and him and so did his disciples. A, woman's, a woman suffering hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the tassel on his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I shall be cured. And the interesting thing that in the prophet Zechariah, and I think there's another one, is it Malachi? Uh, there are two references to this very concrete idea that when the Messiah comes, there will be healing power in his garment. Not just in his person, in his garment. Which shows that the Messiah would have extraordinary gifts that would radiate even through his clothing. You remember at Mount Tra at Tabor, his clothes became shinier than, than a bleacher could make them this effort of human description for the phenomenon that the disciples are experiencing. Again, we could go back to the verse we had just a moment ago from the psalm. In you, my God, I place my trust. And how many people go to shrines all over the world to have that moment of intimacy with God? to pray for special needs. We can add a little request today. Pope Francis is having surgery. And I'm not sure, I just know that with the headline, I didn't have time to see the article. So I think it's his colon, but I don't remember 100%. But so we can say a prayer for him and everybody else who's having surgery. So many prayer intentions you all send in. In you, my God, I place my trust. I 
A woman suffering hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the tassel on his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I shall be cured. Jesus turned around and saw, saw her and said, Courage, daughter, your faith has saved you. And from that hour, the woman was cured. And we can all do that. Today we touch Jesus' cloak by praying. Lord, we entrust to you all our sick ones. All those who are struggling, those who are broken. In any way, morally, spiritually. In their health. In their relationships. And Danielle Cariola marvelously painted this part of her finger as healed, and the rest of her hand is still sickly. He, he studied 20 elderly sick women to come up with this hand. And that first portion of her finger, the first joint of her finger, is presented as healed, showing how he's capturing that moment when the power went out from Jesus' cloak and into the woman. That comes from the account in Mark's Gospel where Jesus asks the question, who touched me? And the disciples who are all crowded around say, this crazy question, Jesus, everybody's pushing. In you, O oh God, I place my trust. So let's go to the other part of the story, to Jairus' chapel. Upstairs. And see this work of Maria Jesus Ortiz de Fernandez, who did such splendid work here in fresco and in mosaic. And also contributed so much to the whole concept here in Duke and Altum. There we can see the sun shining in again. So but right now we're going to go here to Jairus' chapel. The shape of these hands changes so much just seeing it from different angles. One hundred and sixty thousand pieces of Murano glass in each of the four mosaics. It looks like a sunrise sky, doesn't it? In a way, a pre sunrise sky. And then we have Jesus coming to this official's house. And Mark's Gospel tells us his name is Jairus.
and he saw the flute players singing their dirges, their sad songs, and the crowd who were making a commotion. And he said, go away, the girl is not dead, she is sleeping. And they ridiculed him. When the crowd was put out, he came and took her by the hand. And in Mark's gospel, there are two words. He says, Talita, little girl, come. Talita, come. But in Matthew's gospel, it has less details as we see. And he simply says, and the little girl arose. And in Mark's gospel, he says, give her something to eat. But that's not mentioned here in Matthew's gospel. It's simply, and you spread of this throughout the land. There's so much to say about this, but we'll just do a little prayer right now to conclude. And many girls come here with their parents and they put their hand in Jesus' hand. And they look up at Jesus and with their parents and say, Jesus, thank you for holding my hand. Keep my hand in your hand always. Never let it go, Jesus. And the parents pray, thank you, Jesus, for holding our daughter's hand, a spouse's hand, or a sister's hand, or a granddaughter's hand. Fill her with life, Jesus, as you fill this little girl with life one day. And especially when her greatest day comes, fill her with the fullness of everlasting life with all the angels and saints forever in glory. So people, thank you very much for joining us today. Let me open this window here so we can get one last glimpse of the sun. So God bless you, see you later.